Hello everybody and welcome to Friar Tim's Friarside Chat for Monday, March 30th, 2020. Greetings from the St. Anthony Friary front parlor once again, which is about the best lit room in the house. So this Friarside Chat doesn't look too dark and foreboding. Uh, Friar Bill and I continue to be well. The friar who had flu-like symptoms is still not feeling perfectly well, but it seems like the worst of the effects are beyond him. And at the same time, we're still waiting for the test for coronavirus. So we are still under quarantine as we speak. But Friar Bill and I are well. We have uh, no symptoms. He is actually outside playing in the garden, planting, planting some flowers to beautify our backyard. What I'd like to do with you today is to go over our vision document, the strategic plan. If you have not seen it, or if you're not familiar with it, please stop this video and go to Newman's web page and look for the indications to find the strategic plan. It's downloadable and printable, and it would be much more helpful if you would follow along with me to do that. Now, we come back. First of all, I'd like to thank Kathy Eldridge and Joe Gannon for kind of spearheading the work on this. They and a core team, plus I'm told many, many, many individuals contributed to this well before I arrived at Newman. I sat down with the wider core team and then with Joe and Kathy, and we refined the document a little bit Kind of wordsmithing it and you'll see some places where it's wordsmith and that's where I'd like to walk you through it. It starts first with identity and mission. It starts, we are the Newman Catholic community. Now, as we're all aware, Newman really has two major components to it. The campus ministry to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a Roman Catholic parish. And rather than starting off by describing the two components, we chose to underline the oneness. So we are the Newman Catholic community, a parish of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Raleigh. Canonically, that's what we are, that's who we are, ministering to students, faculty, and staff of UNC, and alumni, families, friends, and visitors to Chapel Hill. Again, this reflects our canonical status as who we are. We are technically known as a personal parish or a non-territorial parish, which is a canonical designation saying that is ad personam. And the personam that the Latin refers to is anything having to do with UNC Chapel Hill. So we are literally a parish built in, around, and for, and serving UNC in Chapel Hill in all of its wider constituencies. Our mission is to invite people to encounter Jesus Christ. Again, it has to start with Jesus Christ. It does not start with us. It starts with Christ. And we who have encountered him at least sacramentally in baptism. And we who encounter him in strange and mysterious ways in our sacramental life, in our prayer life, and in our community life, we need to invite others to encounter Jesus for themselves and with us. And when we invite them to accompany, when we invite them to encounter Jesus Christ, we walk with them, and we accompany them. The model for this, of course, is the model that we have been living as a church all during the Lenten season, which is to invite the elect and candidates for full communion to encounter Jesus Christ with us, and then we accompany them. And we accompany them towards what? Deeper discipleship a deeper level of following Christ, a deeper level of modeling one's life after Christ and committing to continue his mission. 
Again, Christianity always has this twofold aspect to itself, which is I follow Jesus, my own personal holiness, but my own personal holiness has also got to radiate out into mission. My discipleship can never be merely me-focused, egocentric. At the same time, if my activity is frenetic and not centered in Christ, there's something off from that end. The third core thing that holds a Christian community together is, in fact, the whole question of community. Our vision. Newman fosters growth in Christian discipleship through accepting the invitation to deeper union with God. Again, God is constantly calling us to deeper union with him through Christ. It is always a call to come out a little bit deeper. It is always a call like Abraham to leave the land of Canaan and come into the land that I am giving you. It is always the call of the people of Israel to leave Egypt, that place of slavery, and come to dwell in a land that is yours, that you cultivate, that you become a people in, that you join in, but it involves a willingness to come a little bit deeper with God. Come out a little deeper. Come out a little deeper. Come out a little deeper. Joyfully responding to truly being church in fellowship and community. Once again, while Christianity has this very clear dimension of me and God in personal holiness, this is always part of a greater and wider us that we call community, that we call fellowship, that we call church, that we call parish. And I personally, and we as a community, can never rest on our laurels and never feel self-satisfied because of all of the people who need to be served, loved, invited into deeper discipleship, invited into deeper communion, cared for that are outside the realm and outside the area of our parish. We are grounded by and in vibrant liturgical celebration. Our gathering together every Sunday, and for a smaller group of us, our gathering together every day in liturgical celebration gives us vibrancy, gives us life, gives us buoyancy, gives us an energy of the spirit. It grounds us in that. It because it grounds us in Christ, whom we celebrate and who is present in this liturgical celebration. It grounds us in that and it grounds us by that. Because the end of Mass, every time, is go out there. Eumtes docete. Go out there and teach. Go out there and heal. Go out to all the world and witness. Go out there and do something. So we are grounded in and we are grounded by the liturgy so that we might go out and serve. We strive to be a local church community, growing together in our Catholic faith, a local church community in the greater Catholic world, which encompasses the Diocese of Raleigh, which encompasses the Catholic Church in the United States, and which encompasses the entire Catholic Church throughout the world under the communion and the shepherd of Pope Francis. Where all might experience a sense of belonging. Do I really belong here? Do I feel as if I matter here? Do others accept and love me and think of me and recognize me as someone who matters? 
Another way of asking that is if someone is absent, do we really feel their absence or not? And again, this sense of belonging for us always has, at Newman, has a twofold piece. Both parishioners who live in the greater Chapel Hill area, whom many times we refer to as the permanent community, a phrase I'm not particularly thrilled with because who defines permanency? Uh, a grad student who's here for three, four, five, or six years doing his or her doctorate certainly sounds kind of permanent to me. But again, parishioners who live in the greater Chapel Hill area and the UNC students for whom Newman is their home away from home. It's been interesting talking to students and listening to their experiences, particularly in interactive coffee houses, how what they miss is just hanging around and being together at Newman. It really is a place away from home, a home away from home. We envision a community of active participation and involvement in worship, spiritual growth and development, stewardship of time, talents, and treasure, and service in and for the surrounding community. It's those four core values, those four core areas that constitute our identity and mission. Community, spiritual growth, stewardship, and service. Now, let's look at them one by one. We value spiritual growth as disciples of Jesus Christ. This then fundamentally asks us the question, am I growing in my spiritual life? Am I praying and behaving and responding exactly the same way I did today than when I was eight 10, 12, or 18 years old? Just on a simple question. When I celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation as a penitent, I ask myself the question, am I confessing the same sins that I did when I was 10, or 16, or 25? Is there some growth? Is there some refinement? So we value growth. Now, as we all know, growth is messy. Growth, growth is uneven. Growth is sometimes unexpected growth in areas where we don't want it. Basically look at the human body and see where fat hangs where you don't particularly necessarily want it. But we value growth. A growth as a discipleship in Jesus Christ which always has to have two pieces to it. The first is an understanding. We are part of a Catholic tradition that has a very long and deep intellectual, theological, and philosophical tradition. We have a finely articulated and deeply nuanced faith that certainly has enough to respond to the critiques of modern science, the critiques of modern scientism, the critiques of modern philosophy, and frankly, the critiques of modern atheism, or frankly, practical modern atheism, which is people who don't necessarily deny the existence of God, but live as if God actually didn't exist. We need to have some understanding, and we need to be able to talk about our faith with a certain level of intellectual acumen, at least a basic catechetical grounding in the basic important parts of our faith. This is really why I asked Jim Hines during this Lenten season to lead us in reflections on the fundamental questions of why God why Jesus Christ, and why Trinity? The basic, fundamental things of what we believe in. 
So we need to understand this tradition and be aware of this tradition in order to be able to articulate it and frankly do some basic modern apologetics. Sometimes, if nothing else, to our own spouse and families. And certainly, beyond that, in our workplace and in our social circles. But, if our faith is merely intellectual, if our faith is merely catechetical, if our faith is merely conceptual, we can spit out every line of the catechism with a stunning accuracy but still never have truly experienced Jesus Christ. And that's the second part of spiritual growth, to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To know him, to love him, to have experienced him, to be able to talk about him, in our daily lives. I want to share a story with you that happened many, many years back. Back in the 1980s, a number of Soviet bloc governments would attempt to smuggle and infiltrate people into sensitive ecclesiastical conditions. And there was a young Czechoslovak man who presented himself at the sacred convent in Assisi asking to be admitted to the order. And a number of the more astute friars were just a little bit suspicious because he seemed a little too good to be true and the story was a little bit too heroic to be really believable. But he was charming, engaging, and seemingly quite, quite sincere. When they finally figured out how to really test him, one of the older friars sat down with him and just said, describe your relationship with Jesus Christ to me. And the guy couldn't do it because he didn't have one. There's the rub. Secondly, we value community as indispensable to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Our American culture is decidedly individualistic, and Americans underline and value and stress individual rights, individual responsibilities, and an individual way of doing things. Yet our culture also feels lonely, alienated, and alienating, and perhaps this enforced isolation of the coronavirus will conversely make us a little bit more accepting to being in a group. A number of years ago, a probably one of the best sociologists of American religion and American civic culture, wrote a book with the interesting title, Bowling Alone, in which he cited the statistic that every year, more and more people bowl, but every year, less and less people bowl in organized leagues. That is, I do it when I feel like it, as I feel like it, with whom I feel like it, but I don't want to be tied to any group. We also value Christian community. Why? Because Jesus Christ desires his disciples to come together as one body. Third, we value stewardship. If, well, let's take it from another end. If I've invested my money in some company, I tend to pay more attention to that company. 
I tend to follow it on the stock market. I tend to read articles about it. I look at myself in my own life. If I happen to know someone in some country around the world, I will more than likely read an article in the foreign affairs section of a newspaper than if I know nobody or nothing in that particular area. If I do not invest my money, my time, and my talent in Jesus Christ and in his church, I don't pay much attention to it. Or my attention is so flagging, whimsical, and not rooted and capricious completely that it's very easy to get lost and very easy to drift. Finally, we value service, which fosters the dignity of every person. Why? Not because we're good humanists, not because we're nice human beings, but because we strive to be faithful to the command of Jesus, who tells us to love one another, and who tells us that whoever does one of these things to the least of my sisters and brothers does it to me, Jesus Christ. So this is the first part of our strategic plan, basically our identity, mission, vision, and core values. Tomorrow, I'll continue with page two of this document and walk you through the practical steps, the, the practical strategic plans that we'll be developing in the next year. I hope you're all surviving this well. Recognize that as your shepherd and as your pastor, I miss you. I miss seeing you. After he presided at Mass this yesterday morning, Friar Bill said to me how odd it is to preach to an empty chapel, only me being there, but virtually thinking of the hundreds of people that I would normally be seeing face to face. Your absence pangs my heart, and I hope my love for you is wide enough and deep enough and authentic enough that you can feel it even through the digital airwaves. And let's pause for just a quiet moment in prayer. And in that most Catholic of prayers, we entrust ourselves to the loving protection of Mary, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Take care, and God bless.